Which translation of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables is the best? Today we're going to do a Hugo taste test comparing three different popular translations and we'll find out. We'll find out what the best translation for you is. Les Miserables, published in the original French, uh, was published in 1862 and the very first translation came out that same year, which is a bit unusual uh, for books in translation. Usually there's a bit of a lag between the translated works. But the very first translation was by a translator called Wilbur. Then there was, there was many more translations along the way, but the most popular one, or one of the most popular ones today, the one that people typically use in book clubs or classes and lectures, is the Norman Denny, which is in paper, uh, Penguin paperback here. That was published in 1976. This was my recommended translation for the Hardcore Literature Book Club. Come autumn of this year, we're going to be deep reading Les Miserables across a couple of months. Uh, there's a link in the description below if you want to sign up to be notified when that happens, or you can just join today. We're reading Crime and Punishment. We've also read Anna Karenina. It's a good club. Um, and then the most current translation, or I believe at the time of recording this is the most current one, is by Christine Donoher, an Oxford academic, and she translated it as The Wretched. That's the most current translation, and I must say this one personally, so far from what I've seen, is vying for top spot and has a very special place in my heart. But what we're going to do is we're going to do something very interesting today and we're going to compare the same passage across these three translations and I'm going to ask you which one you prefer. I'm not going to tell you which is which until afterwards. So get yourself a pen and paper and mark down your response, your impression, how much aesthetic pleasure you derive from each of these. We're doing a blind Hugo taste test. And drop your favourite in the comments below. And then also, if you're wondering which translation of Les Miserables should I read, read the one that you've chosen from these, the one that you prefer. When it comes to translation, everybody gets, they, they get their favourite translation and it can be a bit vehement. It can be um, quite aggressive when it comes to which translation you should read. I've encountered this when it comes to the Russians. People will get angry, like, oh, Richard Pevere and uh, the Pevere and Volokonsky translation of Dostoevsky, Tolstoy is better than Constance Garnett, or maybe Rosamund Bartlett is best. People get really tired to their favourite translation and will defend it to the death. But what's important is you find the one that speaks to you. The problem with reading in translation, I've found, is not not being able to pick up on nuance. It's procrastination. People will put off reading these great books because they don't have the best translation, whatever that means. Seeing as translations really vary, the theory of translation is so varied. Do we translate nuance and sense and meaning? Do we translate literally or do we just try to convey in English or whatever language you're translating into the effect that the uh, native would have uh, received? And then who's to say that that's the effect that the native uh, native reader would have received because every reader is different. Um, one caveat is, yeah, purists are going to say that the best way to read Les Miserables is in the original French. But if you don't speak French, it might take you a while to get to such an advanced level that you can appreciate it. Even if you do speak French as a second language, you may not be able to derive as much enjoyment out of the original as you will reading in translation, unfortunately. And this is a, a very real barrier to people, people who are purists and are learning different languages, they'll put off reading these books because they don't know the original. And I think that's a bit of a shame, um, because yeah, of course, the original is going to give you um, something that you won't get in translation, but the original will be there waiting for you whenever you get good enough to read it, or perhaps you just resign yourself to the fact that maybe you're not going to learn French. I'm going to teach myself Russian to appreciate Anna Karenina, but I appreciate also that it might take a while to get there, and that's okay. It's more important that you read a translation today, or soon when you want to read a book, than waiting an indeterminate amount of years to that special day when you might actually be able to read the original. Now maybe that day will come, but maybe not. What does stay the same in translated works is the characters, the story, the themes and preoccupations of the world. Luckily, these transcend language, they transcend time and boundaries. Are some translations better than others? Yes, of course. When we do a Don Quixote Cervantes taste test, we're going to compare 10 different translations. And you'll see that the, there is such a variation in translation that picking the right one 
really does impact whether you can even persevere with the book. If you pick the wrong translation of Don Quixote, you might abandon it after a couple of chapters. If you pick the right one, a translation that really nails the, the nuance and the humour and the characters, you will gobble that book up. It's over a thousand pages and you'll absolutely inhale it. This is true of Les Miserables and there is a discrepancy between translations. Now, without further waffle and ado, let's get into comparing these three translations. And this is going to be pretty special for me because although I've read all three, I haven't compared this specific passage. I've just picked it out and I really like this passage. I think it's a beautiful one. Let's see how each translator renders it in English and get your pen and paper ready and poised. Close your eyes if it helps um, and relax. Let the words wash over you and then let me know in the comments below which one you like the best. Okay, we're going to read the first translation, and I'm not telling you who wrote this one yet. Will there be a future? We feel we might almost ask ourselves this question when we see so much terrible darkness. Grim confrontation between the selfish and the wretched. In the selfish, prejudices. The ignorance of a superior education. Appetite fed by overindulgence. The insensitivity of an indurating prosperity. Fear of suffering that in some extends to an aversion to those who suffer. Relentless complacency. An ego so inflated it denies access to the soul. In the wretched, greed, envy, a hatred of seeing others enjoying themselves. The convulsions of the human beast within them seeking satisfaction. Hearts befogged. Sadness, need, fatalism, ignorance impure and simple. Must we continue to raise our eyes to heaven? Is the pinpoint of light we glimpse there the kind that fades away? It is dreadful to see the ideal thus lost in the depths, small, isolated, almost imperceptible, twinkling, but surrounded by those great menacing darknesses monstrously banked up around it, yet no more in danger than a star swallowed up by a cloud. Okay, that's the first one. Write down your impression. You can um, write down what you make of the poetry of it. And, and Victor Hugo was a poet turned novelist. Les Miserables is sprawling. It's a great epic thing. It's not really a novel. There's a lot of digressions and tangents, and there's a lot of chapters and episodes that are somewhat irrelevant to the whole story. He goes way off the beaten track, but he is a poet. He's a novelist, one of the great um, French novelists with strong poetic sensibility. So perhaps you're going to rank that on poetic uh, feel, if you like that. Um, think about rhythm, think about colour, life, verve, vitality. Think about all that. That's, and, and let's go on to the second, second translation. Get your pen and paper ready. Will the future ever arrive? The question seems almost justified when one considers the shadows looming ahead, the sombre confrontation of egoists and outcasts. On the side of the egoists, prejudice, that darkness of a rich education, appetite that grows with intoxication, the bemusement of prosperity which blunts the sense, the fear of suffering which in some cases goes so far as to hate all sufferers and unshakable complacency, the ego so inflated that it stifles the soul, and on the side of the outcasts, greed and envy, resentment at the happiness of others, the turmoil of the human animal in search of personal fulfilment, hearts filled with fog, misery, needs and fatalism, and simple impure ignorance. Should we continue to look upwards? Is the light we can see in the sky one of those which will presently be extinguished? The ideal is terrifying to behold, lost as it is in the depths, small, isolated, a pinpoint, brilliant but threatened on all sides by the dark forces that surround it. Nevertheless, no more in danger than a star in the jaws of the clouds. Okay. Let me know what you thought of that one. Write down your ranking. Again, you can give it a ranking out of 10 or a star ranking out of 5. 
But generally, start weighing them and measuring them against each other and let me know which one you prefer. Now let's get into the final one and then I'm gonna reveal which was which, okay? Will the future come? It seems that we may almost ask this question when we see such terrible shadow, sullen face to face of the selfish and the miserable on the part of the selfish, prejudices, the darkness of the education of wealth, appetite increasing through intoxication, a stupefaction of prosperity which deafens, a dread of suffering which, with some, is carried even to aversion for sufferers, an implacable satisfaction, the me so puffed up that it closes the soul, on the part of the miserable, covetousness, envy, hatred of seeing others enjoy, the deep yearnings of the human animal towards the gratifications, hearts full of gloom, sadness, want, fatality, ignorance, impure and simple. Must we continue to lift our eyes towards heaven? Is the luminous point which we there discern of those which are quenched? The ideal is terrible to see, thus lost in the depths, minute, isolated, imperceptible, shining, but surrounded by all those great black menaces, monstrously massed about it, yet in no more danger than a star in the jaws of the clouds. There we go, that's all three translations. Let me know which one you preferred, one, two, or three. Now let's reveal them. The very first one was the most recent one, Christine Donoher, 2013. Um, personally, I think this one sounded the most modern, but it also, I'm not going to give my ranking or my favourite just yet. I'm going to pop it in the comments once others have weighed in. I don't want to influence it too much. But I think some of the poeticism was stripped out of the Donoher translation. It might have been the easiest to understand. Um, but I felt very pulled towards the second one, which was the Norman Denny translation. And then I was, funnily enough, really quite um, unexpectedly drawn to the very first translation. That was the third one. Number three was the Wilbur translation. So if you liked number one, you liked the Christine Donner translation. If you liked number two, you liked the Norman Denny 1976 translation available in Penguin paperback. Links in the description below to whichever one you want to grab. And if you liked the last one, you liked the Charles E. Wilbur translation. The very first one that came out alongside Victor Hugo's original 1862. I really liked, I just want to comment on a couple of things that I liked about that Wilbur one. I liked the poeticism in some of the, the, the turns of phrase. Um, surrounded by those great black menaces, monstrously massed. Menaces monstrously massed. I really liked that. And I liked uh, the end of the first paragraph. Uh, he talks about hearts full of gloom, sadness, want, fatality, ignorance, impure and simple. I really like that rendering because we talk about things being pure and simple. Ignorance, impure and simple. That's really nice. Uh, sullen face to face of the selfish and the miserable. There's something very, there's, it's archaic in its construction and its language, but it is deeply poetic, isn't it? And it'll be interesting if anybody speaks French to know which one comes closest to the original in any sense. And I thought, I thought actually the Donoher one, I thought she kind of overcomplicated certain parts which were a bit more straightforward in the Norman Denny one on the side of the egoists prejudice, that darkness of a rich education, it seems a bit more straightforward, doesn't it? And it seems like a balance between the two, you know, making it comprehensible to English, um, but also sort of giving a little injection of poeticism as well. Um, Denny renders his as hearts filled with fog, whereas uh, Donoghue says hearts befogged. Um, which one of those do you like? Hearts filled with fog or hearts befogged? That's, I, I don't know about that one. But they all sort of seem to render the very last words, at least, jewels of the clouds, uh, the same. But anyway, we're trying to make this a communal, uh, collective decision. Which is the best translation of Les Miserables? There isn't a definitive. It is up to your personal aesthetic taste. So let me know what one you prefer. Drop it in the comments below. And after a bit of time, I'll weigh in with my favourite. And if you're interested in reading Les Miserables as part of a wider book club, then check out the Hardcore Literature Book Club below if you want to enroll today. Uh, please join the Proust here and you'll be treated to a 
quite lengthy back catalogue of uh, poetry analyses, a deep dive into Anna Karenina, we've just kicked off Crime and Punishment, and much more. It's a lot of fun and we've got a good group together, so you're warmly welcomed. And we'll be reading Les Miserables um, in the autumn of this year when the winds are kicking up and it's all blustery and cold and dark. Um, but first we'll be reading Don Quixote over the summer. So. Thank you again for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like and subscribe button and let me know your favorite translation in the comments. Thank you very much.